over a, a cold. So I, I'm going to try really hard just to, to keep it in and maintain, but I apologize in advance for any, any coughing. Okay, so um, I have a PowerPoint presentation ready to go for everybody. And can you see my screen? Maybe I can't see you all. So Nicole, if you could just tell me. Yeah, I can see yeah. you. Perfect. Looks okay. great. Thank you. Okay. So um, Nicole, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, Mark and Sherry Nichols, thank you so much for, um, for inviting me to this. And for all of you who are giving up an hour of your night to hear me talk, um, thank you so much. That is really, really awesome. My name is Rachel Davidson, and I'm an Associate Professor of Communication at Hanover College. And um, before I get started with some of my research, I wanted just to start with a little bit of story time. So um, my oldest daughter just graduated from high school last weekend, which is crazy. When she went to kindergarten for the first time, I remember very vividly that day putting her on the bus. She was so excited, but I think I was more excited than she was because I knew I had the whole day to myself. <laughs> like, holy cow, this is so exciting. So this was back in 2008, right when I first started to, um, when I um, joined Facebook. And so I decided that part of my freedom, I would go to Facebook and I would gen or create a post sharing uh, probably a picture, but then also the good news that Carolina got on the school bus for the first time. And I thought I would get, you know, some comments and stuff, but I was really shocked because what I ended up getting were just a flood of comments from other mothers who had been through that situation and had told me how sad they were and how many tears they shed. I, I specifically remember the phrase waterworks. <laughs> to describe that day. And that was the first time that I was like, oh my gosh, I feel really guilty. Like I saw this as just a really exciting moment in my life. And I didn't cry at all, nor did that even cross my mind. So that moment, um, the reason I wanted to start with that, is that was the first time that I started to think about um, my research and how my personal life also intersected with my research. So. Um, when this happened, I was working on my master's in, um, in applied communication, and I remember thinking, okay, I need, I have some research questions here. So what creates mother guilt? But then I realized before I explored what creates mother guilt, I also need to think about what does it mean to mother? And so this um, innocuous moment um, ended up spurring my, um, my research agenda, which is in um, understanding motherhood. So before I, I get into some specific research, I, I want to situate this into um, my disciplinary home, which is in communication. So um, the ways in which a scholar might pursue answering a research question depends on their discipline and also depends on their methodology. <clears throat> so I'm in my academic home is communication, and this is the study of human communication. And there are lots of different ways that you might study human communication. Some people study real life relationships or real life um, people, me and you, right? What I am interested in studying um, is in the subset of what's called rhetoric. And I'm interested in studying the public artifacts that humans, that real life people create, and that they create for large mass consumption. So I'm interested in film and television and advertising, music, lots of different um, types of public artifacts. So I wanna pause just for a second and try to utilize the chat. I don't know if this will work because I actually, I can't see the chat. So maybe Nicole, if you could just tell me what if people are posting. So I just, maybe just take a second and post in the chat your favorite public artifact. And I'm including mine in here. So I love stories in every form, but I'm especially, um, I love movies and television. And shout out, I did just see the new Top Gun and it was pretty phenomenal. So if you wanna type in that, you can too, if you've watched Top Gun. Ooh, maybe I can't see the chat. Something just popped up. Oh, 
my colleague, newspapers. That's so awesome of you, especially local newspapers. You haven't seen the new Top Gun. You should. I think your whole family. Janet, film, TV, series on Netflix. Very good. Awesome. Okay. That's, that's good enough. All right, so hopefully my screen is still sharing. So I wanna talk a little bit about how you might study film and television since that is what I study. So the method that I use is rhetorical criticism. And sometimes um, this is called media analysis. Sometimes it's called textual analysis. But I found this quotation that I like um, to use. So I'll read this and then talk a little bit more about my method. So the purpose of media analysis is not to determine whether the media representations are empirically accurate, but rather to explore how those representations shape our social imagination. And so in my research, I'm not interested in uncovering the capital T truth of something, but I'm interested in offering an informed interpretation of, um, of a representation or of a message, of a, a particular reading of a public artifact. And so in doing that, I'm primarily trying to answer two questions. And the first one is what? So what media representations do we see? Or what messages do we see? And then the second is how do those get presented to audiences? And so um, the what question typically is the more the most intuitive because storytellers are very good about getting um, inviting audiences to understand the messages that they are sending to us. But what rhetorical criticism or media analysis then does is walk backwards a little bit, to try to understand how. So we look for evidence in those public artifacts and those evidence might be music, might be um, characters, um, their appearance, their actions, camera placement, lighting, um, even dialogue. And so all of those things are evidence that we might use to support a what, what media representations do we see? So I thought it would be fun to watch a quick, um, or just to do a quick rhetorical criticism, though I think I need to reshare my screen because I probably forgot to hit share my sound. So if you could Bear with me for one second. Okay, share. Oh, no, I did. Okay. Glad that I checked. All right, so we're going to watch just a couple of minutes of this um, silly SNL skit about the perfect mother, and we'll walk through a, a mini rhetorical criticism. Much. So, um, what I might do if I was approaching this, if I wanted to analyze this clip, I might first start with the question of what messages about motherhood do I see? And pretty easily, although this is satire, we can, we can see this clip drawing upon issues of good and bad momming, right? So a good mom is in control and enjoys parenting. A bad mom is out of control and maybe doesn't enjoy every moment of parenting. So once that what, um, what question is answered, then we move to the how. So how do these images get presented to audiences? So what I might do then is look at, and this is the middle column on the right-hand side, how were these characters um, presented to us? What was their appearance? What were their actions? And so then we might map out, well, the good mom smiles and appears to be put together. A bad mom um, is not smiling and the hair is a mess and um, doesn't look as put together. I might also look at how um, the dialogue is presented between these, these characters. And so we might see then that the good mom says that she enjoys every minute of parenting. And then the bad mom says uh, something relevant to feeling insane, right? And so that's kind of a, a, a real quick rhetorical criticism. But again, this is satire, so it really is just picking fun at being a perfect mom because the perfect mom doesn't exist. But regardless, we still can see that even though it's, it is poking fun at the perfect mom, we still see um, 
you know, that contrast between what it means to be a good mom versus what it means to be a bad mom. I think it's kind of fun. Okay, so my research then looks at what and how meaning about motherhood is created in popular culture artifacts. I don't just study motherhood, but that's what I find the most fun and interesting. So I typically look for um, public artifacts that, that create meaning, meaning about motherhood in, in certain ways. So I'm gonna revisit my initial research question. So this is what started my interest in motherhood. So I wanted to know what creates mother guilt and what does it mean to mother? <clears throat> but I have to frame these questions within my um, method. They have to be answerable. I couldn't answer those questions um, through rhetorical criticism, but what I can answer is in what ways is motherhood rhetorically constructed through the artifacts that we consume daily? Because I do believe that um, although we're talking about representations, that those representations do have an impact on the way in which we understand ourselves and the way in which we understand the world in which we live. So, so that is my, my primary research question um, now. Um, before I get to a particular case study, I wanted to just review a, a quick um, research on motherhood studied academically. So Adrian Rich, um, wrote a lot of seminal ideas about motherhood in terms of how we might analyze motherhood from an academic perspective. And in, when she did that, she distinguished between two types of mothering. The first she called relationally empowered mothering. This is the real life mothering that between mother and child, right? And so she sees this as an empowering role. This is a really important thing. Mothers are amazing. But what she said is that what we tend to get in a lot of our um, public discourse is patriarchal motherhood. And that isn't real mothering. What that is, is it's an ideology that maintains some, some problematic issues. So one of those issues is that patriarchal motherhood says it's an ideology that all women want to be mothers. So that's called essentialization. Two, that maternal ability and the ability to love, mother love, that those are innate within us to all mothers. And that's called naturalization. And finally, that all mothers find joy and purpose in motherhood, and that's called idealization. And so in my research, I'm looking more at this latter part, the patriarchal motherhood. So to what extent do public artifacts draw upon patriarchal ideas about motherhood? Because again, I'm interested in understanding how those, rep how those representations are presented to us because I do feel like they have real life impact on the real life mothers um, who, you know, who take on this role or who have, are in this role. Okay, so, um, to introduce you to um, some of my research, you know, it's it would probably be a very easy task for all of us to spot good mothers in popular culture. So good mothers prioritize children's needs many times over their own needs. Good mothers um, comfort their children, they're maternal. Um, good mothers enjoy being a mother. And this is what Lee calls the fantasy mother. Some, a fantasy mother who's perfect in every way, except when she has some oatmeal on her sweater or runs a little late for a parent-teacher conference. Conversely, it's probably just as easy for us to spot bad mothers in popular culture. So they don't conform to good mothering sta uh, standards, right? So they don't enjoy motherhood. They're not maternal. They don't put the needs of their children ahead of their own. And many times they're portrayed as less than, less than human a lot of times. And they, a lot of them are punished for their lack of conformity to good mothering standards. So in, in a, a piece of popular culture, punishment might be things like death, killing off of a character, might be divorce, or it could just be this is an unlikable character that people um, don't want to be around. And this is what, or who Lee calls a monstrous mother. And a monstrous mother um, either mistreats her children or struggles with emotions that stifle her ability to parent. 
So over the past 10-ish years or so that I've been studying motherhood as it is represented in popular culture, what I have found is that what is more than commonplace, I don't even know it's more than commonplace, it is commonplace that there is um, many times a good bad mother dichotomy that we see, which just means that we get typically two different representations, a good mom who does all those things that we just discussed, and then a bad mom who does, does not do those things. And so this is a problem. This is a problem for several reasons. Why it's inaccurate. There's We need lots of different types of mothers, right? Um, <clears throat> and there are different types of mothers. Um, another thing is that it's difficult to live up to good standards all the time. And so what might happen is, um, you know, an impact, a real life impact that we might experience is if we don't live up to those good or ideal standards, we might start to punish ourselves as mothers, which might um, explain mother guilt or might even, you know, be related to something I've been interested in is, is mother shame. Is this guilt or is this shameful? Am I a bad mother or did I just do something bad? But the, the good bad mother dichotomy also just denies, it's simplistic, right? And so it denies the complexities of real life situations, of real life context, and of real life mothering identities. So because that good bad mothering dynamic is or dichotomy is so commonplace, what I've been trying to do over the last couple of years is look for public artifacts that help us reimagine motherhood beyond just good or bad. So where are the artifacts that deviate from this problematic binary? And the reason I want to do that is I want to extrapolate like lessons, right? So how, what does that look like? And how might that apply to different contexts? And so the case study I'm going to present to you um, for the rest of this talk is um, Bojack Horseman. Um, okay, so the title of this paper is called Animating the Nuances of Bad Motherhood, Rhetorical Strategies of Resistance in Bojack Horseman. This is a paper that I have co-authored um, with one of my research collaborators. Her name is Dr. Katherine Dobris. And um, if you're interested later on to hearing why we've looked at Bojack Horseman, uh, I can tell you it's related to her and her um, teenage son. But I thought I would just pause here just for a second and have you all utilize the chat. So if you can just indicate whether you have watched this series, if you've heard of the series, or if you have no idea what the series is. And I'll stop talking and get a drink for a minute. <clears throat> no idea though. <laughs> no idea, good. Never heard of, oh my gosh. Watch some, okay, no idea, perfect. You've watched some, Nicole, okay, this is good. All right, well, um, maybe after this you'll say, I wanna watch this show. Okay, <clears throat> thank you for that. Okay, um, it seems like a lot of you don't know um, about the, the show, which is fine. I'm just gonna give you um, a little bit of background about it. <clears throat> so Bojack Horseman is an adult animated television series that's on Netflix and it's created, um, it was created by Raphael Bob Waksberg and it aired from 2014 to 2020 using animation. So this is an animated series. This series um, anthropomorphizes, I'm so glad that I said that correctly. <laughs> <laughs> that is a hard word to say. Um, it anthropomorphizes characters, including um, dogs, cats, birds, dolphins, sheep, penguins, and the occasional human. Okay, so this is that's what this world looks like. And in particular, equines are highlighted in the title role of Bojack and his family. So the center of the Bojack universe is Bojack Horseman. He's a middle age, mostly has been celebrity. Um, he was on a show in the 90s called Horsin' Around, which is, um, I'm thinking, in the same vein as like a full house type of show. And um, he currently, though, struggles with um, addiction, depression, and a series of dysfunctional relationships. 
you might be asking why this this particular series. Um, there's a couple of reasons. The show has been hailed by critics, um, both popular and um, academic critics, as ambitious and audacious. It's dark and unorthodox. Um, it offers moral lessons on racism, depression, sexism, self-destructive behavior, trauma, addiction, and the human lived experience. Um, there are some people who have called this show the most extraordinary animated show in the history of the genre. Um, in short, um, one reason we, we wanted to study this show is it offers an unrelenting interrogation and criticism of political and popular discourse. So it's not just for laughs. It is definitely social and critical commentary. Um, what's the, the focus of this paper, though, is on Bojack's mom, Beatrice Horseman, who is framed as the bad mother from seasons one to four. Um, she, throughout the first four seasons of this um, series, um, we mostly get the depiction of Beatrice through Bojack's lens. And, um, and what we see then is we're invited to see Beatrice as um, the cause or the root of a lot of Bojack's problems, actually all of Bojack's adult problems. Um, okay, so I'm gonna show you a few clips from this, um, from the series and actually it's, it's from one episode. And so I'm gonna navigate back and forth between Google Slides and, um, and Netflix. So, um, Please be patient with me. I'm gonna go and we're gonna watch our first clip here and you'll get to meet Beatrice who is here on the screen and then um, you'll see Bojack as a baby and then as a young, young kid. Let me go back to our slide here. And Nicole, could you confirm again that you could hear and see that clip? Yep. Yay. Technology is working so far. Okay, so in this scene, we see baby Bojack and a young Bojack and his resentful mom, Beatrice, smoking in front of him and telling him he's not worth it in a really heartbreaking um, scene. Um, scenes like these are very common throughout the first um, four seasons of the series. And it paints Beatrice again as the cause of, of Bojack's adult problems. So Beatrice is framed as what we called in the paper, the candidate for the worst mother of the year. Um, she resents her son. She neglects and abuses him. She continues to uh, treat him dis disrespectfully throughout his entire adult life. And through scenes like this, <clears throat> audiences are invited to do nothing else with this character other than hate her. We, we despise Beatrice horse, um, Horseman. So she is definitely framed as an appalling mother, creating a potential rationale for understanding um, Bojack's bad adult behavior. However, something different happens in season four, episode two, and this episode is called Time's Arrow. And this was the episode that we were, Catherine um, and I were really intrigued by. So we both, um, after watching this particular episode, we both felt sympathy for Beatrice in ways that we haven't felt sympathy in the first four seasons of the series. So we wanted to understand why, like what is this episode doing um, to invite sympathy for a generally, generally speaking, a pretty, horrible character, right? Um, so while there's no question that, that Beatrice is, is framed as the bad mother throughout the series, there was a way in which in this particular episode that she's written in with some sympathy. So it's, it was clear to us that the Retors wanted us wanted audiences to feel sympathy for her, which is a very rare departure from a very traditional, typical media-driven mother blaming narrative. So in this particular episode, um, it explores Beatrice's dementia and that Bojack is her primary caregiver and must care for his mother, though he's resentful for that and also of her. So I'm gonna play another, um, scene from this particular episode to kind of 
set a, a little bit of context for us. Give me one second. It's so odd. I can't tell you how many times I've watched this episode. And every time I see that beginning moment, I'm just like, oh, this is such a good show. Um, okay. So in this scene, this is the opening scene to the episode, Beatrice has dementia um, and she's confused as to um, why Bojack is driving her to her assisted living home. She actually confuses her son with her former um, housekeeper, Henrietta. And um, so this is through Beatrice's um, dementia perspective. And so um, we talk about this a little bit in our um, in our paper, some evidence for um, communicating what it might be like to have dementia and to experience memories um, if you um, if you have this affliction, um, if you look on the on the screen here, you see Henrietta with her face scratched out. Like, um, and so I we thought that was just a really interesting way to um, to frame what dementia might be like. Recalling a memory, you know, knowing the person Henrietta, but not recalling specific features of the face, for example. So. Um, so this beginning scene previews a few key points of the episode. So um, in that we see three different versions of Beatrice. We see present day Beatrice with dementia. We see an adult woman um, who is being driven by Henrietta, her former housekeeper. And then we see Beatrice as a young girl. So uh, our research questions were really simple for this. Um, we wanted to know what mothering narrative is rhetorically constructed through Beatrice's character? And then um, how does the discourse work then to achieve that construction? And ultimately what we argued is that the episode invited audiences to question a mother blaming narrative through rhetorical transcendence. One of my favorite rhetorical strategies. So um, I, I wanna talk through real quickly um, framing and transcendence as rhetorical strategies. So framing in terms of um, <clears throat> framing public discourse is, um, is a rhetorical strategy where a rhetor might invite an audience to see an issue or a person from a particular perspective through their constructed lens. So they might do this through if, um, character actions, their appearance, through um, dialogue or language, um, sometimes in just with music, the absence of dialogue, we know that Beatrice is the bad mother. She is framed in ways that tells viewers, okay, I know who this person is and I know how I should feel about her. Transcendence as a rhetorical strategy is actually a, uh, a strategy of redefinition where a rhetor might establish a larger context to understand a situation, an issue or a person. So I like to imagine if, if we were all together in a classroom, I would draw on the board uh, a small circle and then a larger circle um, that surrounds that smaller one. So the smaller circle is, is how maybe a person, Beatrice, is framed. What happens in rhetorical transcendence is that the rhetor kind of like broadens our perspective of that initial frame. So we get multiple, um, it's not a replacement of that initial frame, but it, it's a way to, to see a larger context of, of that frame. And what's really important for transcendence is that it can function as a strategy of disruption. So it can disrupt that, um, that established frame. We typically see Beatrice as the bad mother, um, but the transcendence disrupts that. And it could, the disruption just could be, um, I don't, I still don't agree with, with choices that she made, but I, I might sympathize or understand them in a deeper way than I did initially with that one frame. Um, transcendence can also create new ways of thinking and acting and being because it broadens our understanding of an issue or a person. But then important, it's not a replacement of the frame, but just invites a larger understanding. So, <clears throat> As I've mentioned a few times, um, that initial frame for Beatrice is Beatrice as the bad mother. 
So when we first meet Beatrice in these brief exchanges with Bojack, we're led to understand that his contemptible behavior is likely the result of her poor parenting, which is a very common mother blaming narrative. Um, so when we see her through Bojack's eyes, um, we see a, a, a patriarchal ideology of mother blaming. Um, Beatrice seems entirely at fault. And we what happens then is we begin to have sympathy for Bojack who um, bear the brunt of, of her abuse and neglect. So most, most of us are, um, are you know, highly used to this mother blaming narrative. We see that we see this in different iterations, lots of places. So we likely buy that explanation without much convincing. Yes, she's a bad mom. Now he's turned into a bad adult. However, again, in Times Arrow, we begin to see something different. We see Beatrice differently. So I'm gonna show you, this is the last clip I'm gonna show you. Um, well, we'll see some of these new frames, um, transcendent frames of um, Beatrice. Okay. Hopefully I've, I've enticed you to go watch the, the entire episode and its completion. So several things start to happen in this um, excerpt. So these new frames, so we see Beatrice as um, a sweet child, an intelligent young woman. Um, we've earlier saw her um, as an unhappy mother. All of these things start to encourage the audience to begin to develop some level of sympathy for Beatrice. So. Um, in season four, she is diagnosed with dementia and we start to view her life as this series of muddled memories. So Henrietta with her face um, uh, scratched out and there's a lot of these different dream sequence like vignettes. And what this does, it creates this space for an alternative view of her relationship with Bojack and also um, just her character um, and her interactions past and present. So we encounter Beatrice as a child, a teenager, um, a disappointed wife. Um, you, we didn't look at that, but, or actually we did see that in an earlier clip and a frustrated young mother. When we see Beatrice as a little girl, we're introduced to an appealing child who loves her favorite doll and enjoys to read. Um, most of us may cringe when Beatrice's father warns her to stop making books her friends. Reading does nothing for young women but build their brains, taking valuable resources away from their breasts and hips. Um, later in her 20s, when she's preparing for her own coming out party, which her wealthy father um, implores her to take very seriously, Beatrice inquires, oh, will this end poverty, war, and injustice? No, her father answers, but it will help you land a husband. So through some of these flashbacks, we're invited to consider the conditions that shaped her relationship with Bojack and with her role as a mother. We're not particularly asked to forgive Beatrice, and that's a really important point. So we don't forgive her for some of her um, maternal feelings, um, but we are invited to consider how her experiences shape her later mothering behaviors. So essentially, <clears throat> these multiple frames complicate her character and are, um, are sympathizing with this character because we start to see her in a larger context and that transcend, that's what transcendence is. It starts to um, build that larger context around the initial bad mother frame. So returning to um, our research questions um, and then how we answered those in the paper, what mothering narrative is rhetorically constructed through Beatrice's character in Time's Arrow? Well, we argue that the show challenges the mother blaming narrative through transcendence. And then how does it work? How does the discourse work to achieve that construction? And we argue that the TV show accomplishes this in part by generating these multiple frames for Beatrice, which broadens our perspective on how we see her and her relationship with Bojack and her, her mothering choices. 
Well, a couple of things that we concluded in this paper is that um, one time zero, which is the name of this um, particular episode, invites audiences to examine this, this well-worn trope of mother blaming narrative. And that in doing so, it resists a good mother categorization. And in so doing, it broadens our understanding as motherhood as more complex. And so we argued that this episode is part of a contemporary media landscape which presents maternal images that deviate from that good bad binary, providing more nuanced maternal images um, of mothers and mothering, which is a good thing. At least I think it's a good thing. So you might be saying to yourself, okay, this is this is interesting, but so what? Like, why should I care about Bojack Horseman in this particular episode? So <clears throat> I would encourage you to replace this TV series with a contemporary social issue, maybe one that currently divides us. And then I'll leave you with two what ifs, if we do that. What if this series then can be understood as a model for how to challenge binary thinking on social issues? And what if we see transcendence as a rhetorical strategy that might invite deeper pondering and more nuanced thinking about social issues that might um, divide us? So we can talk more on that if, if you want. That concludes what I've prepared for you. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm excited to, to chat with you a little bit more if you want to chat. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There we go. Are you taking questions? Yeah, I'm sorry. Any <laughs> questions? Yes, please. Yeah, of course. I, I am so interested and intrigued, and I was going to ask you about another TV show or what you're working on next. So I'll start with that one. But I do had I did have some ideas about contemporary social issues to discuss oh. that make us seem like we're more divided because we're perhaps not transcending, which yeah. I love. Yeah. Okay. So tell me, tell us about like, if you were to investigate a different artifact. Mm -hmm. any okay. ideas? Yeah. I, I would love any of your ideas. Um, if you all have something where motherhood comes to mind, um, I am, I, I just completed a project on a movie called 20th century woman. Um, and I'll get back to some other artifacts in a minute, but part of the problem that I've seen in finding texts that um, reimagine mothering beyond good or bad are not usually mainstream texts that people or artifacts that a lot of people see. Uh, typically where, where I see those images are in more independent, not as much money being pushed into those, you know, film and television series, unfortunate, unfortunately. Um, that's a whole other a whole other issue, but um, but yeah, I I'm really interested in um, I'm trying to think of like one in particular that um, that I'm looking at now that might be more mainstream. I I really like horror movies, like um, scary movies, especially scary movies that um, depict a mother role as like the villain. And I really <laughs> like understanding like what do the do those mothers represent? Like there's some kind of fear or social anxiety that we have um, that's that's being reflected in those characters who are not just like bad mothers, but are like evil people. And so, and there's unfortunately a lot that fall into, a lot of movies that fall into that category. Do you have an idea of, of a, something that might fit what I'm looking into? Um, so I'm struggling to think about um, um, an artifact, especially a TV show or a movie where a mother and her role as a mother are the primary character mm -hmm. that's really fully mm -hmm. developed. Often you, mm -hmm. I think of a show where the, there are moms in it or there, there there's discussion about child rearing or what that means, but I'm I'm sure I'm just not thinking of it because I don't watch enough, enough television. Yeah. And sometimes it's, it's what I find interesting too, are like um, 
the absence of a mother character, like for example, the new um, new ish Joker film. This was a, a few years ago. The mother character in that film I, I played a very minor role in terms of screen time, but a really significant role in terms of how it led to some of the Joker's dysfunctional pastimes, which is weird. It feels blaming. Yeah, mm -hmm. it feels like so. I think it's what's interesting is looking at an adult character's perception of their mother or their relationship. And I think that's actually where you could get the the sweet spot, mm -hmm. the ticket with some of those rom-com movies where like the like they vilify their adult parents or something. I'm thinking about like Four Christmases or like the what um, movies like Eat, Eat, Pray, Love might have something like that yeah. where they're like big, big hits. And there is an it's like an adult nostalgia piece about looking forward and backward and thinking about, I'll, I'm going to start writing these down yeah, and like please. being more intentional <laughs> about these because I have a really poor memory about this. But also what about, I mean, I'm sure you've seen the amazing hit called Bad Moms, right? Bad Moms? Yeah. And I, I guess, actually... <laughs> I, I actually have, um, this is so funny that you mentioned that, but um, I have a, a published piece. It's a short media criticism piece in Women in Language on Bad Moms. Um, and ultimate, it, with Catherine Dobris too, she is, uh, she's my, my research go-to person. But um, yeah, but one thing that we saw with, with that film is that the the good mother is vilified in that like the good moms are actually those are the bad moms right but the real good moms are the ones who are irresponsible and conform to like more masculine behaviors which we also found kind of troubling too we're like does that that's what we're supposed to do now <laughs> is take on this more you know masculine like bachelor type of role and that's like our key to liberation but um yeah, good call. Val, man, that was so good. Bad moms. I need to study the Christmas version of that movie too. <laughs> Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? Suggestions? How about a um, mommy blog, a mommy blogger looking at that whole genre of like perfect motherhood. And the fun thing about the turn of, I don't actually follow a lot of mom blogs, but I know that there's a, there's like this portrayal of perfection. And then there's this portrayal of reality, which is still often false perceptions of perfection like mm -hmm. oh look at my look at my super messy table <laughs> oh my life is so crazy and like it, the truth is like but my life is awesome and I'm pretty perfect in every other way and so it's like a yeah. false perception but it's a it's a like a genre by which we can we follow and like their stuff and they yeah. like do funny you know memes and tiktoks about the imperfect mom yeah. Yeah, totally. I think, and I think there might be a mommy blog or something that's called Scary Mommy. Yeah, which, I've seen yeah, that. Just yeah. Scary Mommy. But you totally reminded me of something. I can't believe this wasn't even on my radar when you first asked. But um, we are are working together, Catherine and I. On um, we want to look at Karen, the Karen, as the new bad mom. Oh. So that meme um, and how it's kind of played out in social media. We haven't done anything outside of like talking about it but it it will come to fruition but it's it's something that we're really intrigued by right now don't be a karen and as like a a disciplining of um mother don't right so, it's a lot there so anything you encounter that that is related to the karen meme please send to me I don't even know if it's a, just a meme anymore. It's like a, it's a whole thing. It's like a put down now. 
I get called out by my own kids for being in Karen. And I don't, I don't like that. <laughs> then they tell me they're kidding. All right, well, if there isn't any more questions, I just thank you so much, Dr. Davidson, for hosting the session tonight. I've really enjoyed learning more about it. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me in. This is great. And again, thank you to everyone who gave up prime time, family time with your, whoever you're spending time with tonight. This is so nice. Yep, and um, I'll send another thank you email soon and I'll have the recording of the session too if you want to refer back to it later as well. So anyway, it was wonderful to see everybody tonight. I'll hopefully see you guys in the next session as well. So for Dr. Young's session. Yep, coming up can soon. I, can I just, can you guys hear? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a kid screaming in the bathtub at my house. I feel like this sort of encapsulates. I'm like, I have something to do between seven and eight. Can we kind of hold down the volume? And it's like, this is like such a great example of like um, how motherhood and work and, you know, needs mm -hmm. overlap and how transcendence is hard because in a mediated world, we can hear somebody's kids screaming in the background a little bit more. I think that would be such an interesting mashup in terms of like organizational understandings and how motherhood can be reframed because you can now yep. see and hear my kids at my house in ways that before the pandemic when things yeah. were not as easily virtual mm -hmm. it was much harder to see that side of professional people yeah and I think harder to like I've always had a really hard time um when my identities, my professional identity and my mother identity, when they <laughs> clash, and it's not even a clash, I need to practice that reframing and, and transcendence because I think you're right, something has happened in the pandemic that's al allowed people to be more comfortable with, this is, this is what identities, you know, this is what it looks like. So yeah, I love that. Thank you for bringing that up. As I say that, I'm sitting in my office because I did not want to hear my dog. I didn't want my cat to walk in front. I didn't want my kids to jump on Netflix and kick me off. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Anyway, well, thank you everyone so much. And thanks for organizing this, Nicole. That was fun. All right. <laughs> I'll see you guys later. Thank you so much for joining. Bye. Bye, everybody.